السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفاه وبعد My dear viewers, welcome to another edition of our program Gardens of the Pious Today's episode is number 324 in the blessed series of Riyadh al-Saliheen Chapter number 86 باب الوفاء بالعهد وإنجاز الوعد the obligation of fulfilling promises and pledges. The first reference is the first ayah of Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter number 5, in which Allah the Almighty commanded the believers, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, awfu bil'uqood, oh you believe, fulfill your contracts. What is the meaning of awfu bil'uqood? Awfu bil'uqood means, any contract that you agree to sign upon, whether it is written or verbal, you got to fulfill it. You got to stick to your promise. You got to stick to your word. And the contracts are many, as long as it is not an unlawful contract or a condition which is in the contract. Sometimes we stipulate conditions. Uh, maybe the condition itself is... Um, not valid. In this case, the condition should be invalidated and it should not be fulfilled. As we understand that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَن نَذَرَ أَن يُطِيعَ اللَّهَ فَلْيُطِيعَ وَمَن نَذَرَ أَن يَعْصِيَهُ فَلَا يَعْصِيَهُ A nether is some sort of contract. It's a vow. You vow to do something before Allah the Almighty or towards others. So whoever vows makes a vow. And the vow entails something which is perceived as an act of obedience. You must fulfill it. Somebody made a vow to go for Hajj or to go for Umrah. Even though he have done Hajj before, yani any other Hajj afterward is recommended, is voluntary. He must fulfill it. It has become obligatory. Why? Because it's nazr. He vowed to do it. Somebody made a vow to smoke two packs of cigarettes in one hour, challenging people. Can he say, well, I'm only smoking that because I made a vow and it's another? No. The Prophet ﷺ said, وَمَن نَذَرَ أَن يُطِيعَ اللَّهَ فَلْيُطِعَ and whoever vows to do anything which is perceived as disobedience, he should not fulfill it. What should he do? Pay the kafara and abstain from fulfilling the vow which is an act of ma'asiyah or disobedience. Man halafa ala yameenin fara'a ghayraha allati khayran minha. Whosoever takes an oath to do anything, then he realizes afterward that not fulfilling his oath is better. فَرَأَى غَيْرَهَا خَيْرًا مِنْهَا فَلْيَأْتِ الَّتِي هِيَ خَيْرٌ ثُمَّ لِكَفْرْ عَنْ يَمِينَ Let him do whatever is better and pay the ransom. So in the case of النذ, in the case of the vow, and in the case of taking an oath, if you realize that you've made a vow and it entails a sin, you shouldn't do it. What shall I do? You stop it, don't do it, and pay the ransom. You made an oath to do something, but it is wrong. It is haram. You shouldn't do it. Not because it's an oath and you said, Wallahi, that you have to do it. No. Rather, you should cease from doing it and pay the ransom, the kafara, which is, فَكَفَّارَتُهُ إِطْعَامُ عَشَرَةِ مَسَاكِينَ مِنْ أَوْسَطِ مَا تُطْعِمُونَ أَهْلِيكُمْ أَوْ كِسْوَتُهُمْ أَوْ تَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةِ The reference is of Surah Al-Ma'idah. So either to 
feed or to clothe 10 poor people, to buy an outfit for 10 poor people. Obviously, we don't have slaves anymore, so we drop this for now. And if one cannot afford to feed 10 poor people or to buy clothes for 10 poor people, then فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَصِيَامُ ثَلَاثَةِ أَيَّامِ Let him fast for three days, uh, whether consecutive or not. It doesn't matter because Allah didn't stipulate this condition. So awful bil uqud which are lawful, fulfill your contracts which are lawful. The most important and the most valuable contract is the marriage contract. Because in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in a haqqa shuruti bil wafa, a haqqu ma awfaytum min a shuruti an tufu bihi, ma stahlaltum bihi al furuj. The most deserving condition to be fulfilled is a condition that you stipulated upon yourself or you agreed to it in order to make something which was forbidden lawful, such as having a marriage relationship, consummating a marriage, sleeping with a woman, sharing bed with her. It is not permissible to do this outside marriage. Any outside marriage relationship is an act of adultery. Okay, but because of the marriage contract, which we both agree, there is ijab and qabul, and her guardian is giving his consent, and I'm paying the dowry, and there are witnesses, and there is publicity, everybody knows that we're married, it has become lawful. This is the most powerful contract, because it makes the private part of another woman lawful for you to embrace, because of this contract before Allah and before people. So the most deserving and the most worthy condition to be fulfilled is a condition that is stipulated in the marriage contract in order to make this relationship halal, lawful. That's a very important introduction, brothers and sisters. At the time of engagement, when the person is dying to marry this girl, because of whether he's obsessed with her love, or because he loves to be a part of her noble family or because of any worldly reason or religious reason so he is wholeheartedly wants to be a part of this family so sometimes sometimes she stipulates a condition agree and then his mother-in-law stipulates another condition i don't mind and the father-in-law but i want you to do this i agree so if he agrees to any stipulated condition, as long as it is halal, then he must fulfill it. And that is the most important contract, which its stipulated conditions must be fulfilled. Many cases, we have a wife complaining, saying that when my husband got married or wanted to marry me, I told him that, you know, I got to continue my education. I'm still a college student, and I want to finish my education. I want to get a degree. So he agreed, and he said, all the cost of the tuitions and education is on me. And I promise that I shall make everything accessible for you. I shall drop you off to the college and pick you up. And Okay. Then a couple months after the marriage, he says, I changed my opinion. No. I don't have a wife to study and go to college or to uh, take a job. This is not permissible. Why is it permissible? Because he agreed to this stipulated condition. Is this condition halal or haram? Seeking knowledge for a woman is like a man exactly. طلب العلم فريضة على كل مسلم ومسلمة. It is mandatory upon every Muslim, male or female. So he must fulfill this condition. And if he doesn't, he's blameworthy. Sometimes the parents have only one child, one daughter. And because this person is lying to marry their daughter and he is, you know, working for an international company, a multinational company, an oil company, he keeps traveling from one place to another. You know, he's deployed here and there. Initially they said, sorry, we will not be able to give you our daughter because we like our daughter to stay next to us. Okay, that's okay, perfectly fine, I agree. I promise that she will not travel abroad. She would not have to relocate. She got to stay here. 
Then after marriage, three years went by very fine, and now they have a child and says, I've been deployed to another country. Oh, no, I'm not leaving my old parents and I have to be here. No, you're my wife and you must obey me. No, remember, you've taken an agreement. You agreed to a stipulated condition not to travel with her, not to take her to another country. So in this case, you must fulfill your contract. Okay? That is the most worthy condition and contract to be fulfilled because it made what was unlawful, lawful. Awfu bil uqul. And here when Allah the Almighty is calling upon people to fulfill their contracts, He is calling upon people, reminding them with their faith, with their belief. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu. Or who you believe, يعني, remember? You believe in Allah. You must comply with his commands. He is addressing you. If you truly believe in him, then listen to his command. Another condition, the contracts of debt. The sunnah is whenever you take a loan, that both the lender and the debtor must conclude it in writing. The longest ayah in the Quran is known as Ayat al-Dayn of Surah Al-Baqarah. In which Allah the Almighty says, again, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu idha tadayantum bidaynin ila ajalim musamman faktubuh. He's addressing whom? The believers. You gotta keep in mind, he is stimulating in you the faculty of faith. Remember? If you truly believe, you got to fulfill this. This is like business transaction, selling and buying and taking a loan and paying off the debt. Yeah, that is religious too. Whenever you take a loan, it must be number one. We must mention the term. When are you going to pay it off? And one time or in an installment. There is nothing that is called, okay, can you give me like 10 grands? Oh, yeah, sure, here, please. Then we don't name a term. When are you going to pay off? Inshallah, inshallah. When? Yeah, inshallah, one day. That is not valid. You must name a time. You have to put a timetable, time frame, that I'm going to pay it off fully a year from now on that date, on that month, on that week. And or I'm going to pay half of it three months from now, then another half, whenever. And that must be concluded in writing. Factubu. Why? Al Kitaba, writing and concluding the, this is a aqd, contract. It must be concluded in writing in case <coughs> that either the lender or the debtor pass away or both of them. So the ears know that. My father owed this person that much money. He was paying for my college tuitions, and now it's time to pay off. Yeah, but it was his debt. As long as you're one of the heirs, yani if he left money, you would inherit it, then you also have to pay and settle off his debt. And if you examine in Surah An-Nisa, Allah the Almighty addressing the heirs and how much are their shares. So he says, مِنْ بَعْدِ وَصِيَّةٍ تُوصُونَ بِهَا أَوْ دَيْنٍ دِمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ وَصِيَّةٍ يُوصِينَ بِهَا أَوْ دَيْنٍ دِمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ وَصِيَّةٍ يُوصَى بِهَا أَوْ دَيْنٍ So in every case, in every condition, when somebody dies and he leaves behind wealth, before dividing the inheritance, before touching that wealth, we got to look into the record. Is this man uh, in debt? Did he owe anyone, any money or anything? Yes. So before dividing the inheritance and before fulfilling the wasiyah, the will, we got to pay off his or her debt. Oh, but guess what? The debt have engulfed the, in the entire inheritance. Okay, then you don't have any share. Well, it engulfed the entire inheritance and he still owe more money. We call the ears who were expecting, the son was expecting one half, and the daughter was expecting one quarter, and the wife was expecting one eighth, and the f come, come, come. Each one shall give in order to settle the debt of your beloved father, or your beloved mother, or the person whom you are going to inherit from him. 
This is how important it is to fulfill this contract. You don't say, but he's dead. No, even if he's dead, it is your responsibility. Subhanallah, when a man died during the life of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and he was asked to lead his funeral prayer, he just asked first, did he owe anyone any money? When the answer was in the affirmative, he said, Sallu ala sahibikum. You go ahead and you pray. I'm not going to pray. He's not going to lead the funeral prayer. He's not going to attend his funeral prayer. Why not? Because he died while in debt. Until one of the companions said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, his debt is on me. I shall settle it. In this case, the Prophet وسلم, started leading the prayer. Just to emphasize the importance of paying off the debt, settling the loans. It's a aqd. Faktubu. Most of the trouble between people is due to <coughs> word of mouth, overconfidence and trust. I gave him Shaykh that much money because I trusted him and now he says, well, I didn't think that it was a loan. I thought it was a gift. That was like eight years ago. Then somebody bought a certain amount of money. He buys a lot, he builds a house, and mashallah, he starts his project and he prospers. He doesn't even think of paying off the debt. Why? Because we don't have a time frame. Every time you talk to him and say, I told him, inshallah, one day, when? I didn't say. Ila ajalim musamma. The ayah says, it must be ila ajalim musamma. You got a name. Musamma yani named. You got a name. You got to determine when are you going to pay it off. But this way, Sheikh, you're strangling me. Because if you say you got to pay in three months, what if I can't? That's a different story. From the beginning, when you were begging this person to lend you some money, you kept giving him excuses and promises. You promised that I'm expecting to get that much money and my salary, my retirement, I'm going to sell my car. And I promise you, it's just a matter of a couple months. Okay, a couple months, let me make them four. Okay, four months are okay. Six months are okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, this is very generous out of you. Let's write it down here. Why? Because, you know, at the time of taking, the person is very weak, is very humble, is begging. But when he has now the money, he's very arrogant. He's very reluctant to pay. And the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ أَخَذَ أَمْوَالَ النَّاسِ يُرِيدُ أَدَأَهَا أَدَّ اللَّهُ عَنْهَا وَمَنْ أَخَذَهَا يُرِيدُ إِطْلَافَهَا أَتْلَفَهُ اللَّهُ Whoever takes people money, يعني he borrows from them with the intention of paying off and on time because he needed this loan. Then Allah the Almighty promises to assist him, to help him out, to settle his debt and on time. وَمَنْ أَخَذَهَا يُرِيدُ إِطْلَافَهَا And if your intent from the beginning was bad, that you, know, you saw somebody whom you knew that he's very rich, or maybe he inherited 20 million, or he just sold the house and he's got that much money in his account. So you go and you talk to him and you give him all the excuses and my wife is going through a surgery and my son and my daughter, blah, 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 if you can just give me 20 grand and I promise, I promise. While you are giving him all these excuses and promises, you're planning on, once you collect the loan, you're not going to pay it back. Why? Because he's got a lot. He has plenty of money, 20 grands will not hurt him, he's got 20 million. Okay, you collected the 20 grands, you deceived them in the name of Allah. Man akhadaha yuridu itlafaha. And his intention was not to pay back, yani to ruin his wealth, to destroy his property, because he's not going to pay it off. Then, atrafahu Allah. Allah will ruin him, will ruin his wealth, will ruin his family, the stability of his family, will ruin his business. Not once, not twice, he will keep ruining him. Why? Because your bad intention. Ya ayuhal ladina amanu, awfu bil Many people ask, Shaykh, I owe that much money, I borrowed this money from this person to help my daughter to get married, or my son to graduate, or my wife to go through a surgery. Uh, and now I have the money, but I want to go for hajj. I've been saving this money for hajj. Is it okay to go for hajj and postpone the payment? No, it is not okay. 
pay off the debt first. Unless if the lender said, that's okay, you can pay it off next year, I'm not on a hurry. So if he sought his permission and he said, your money is here, but I've been saving money to go for Hajj, and now I have a very good opportunity, I can afford both. If you give me a postponement, maybe three or four months more, I'll be able to perform Hajj and pay off the debt. So the, the lender said to the debtor, no problem, in this case you can go. But the right choice from the beginning, because the ayah of mandating the Hajj says, Man istata'a ilayhi sabila. What does the ayah say? Walillahi ala nasi hijju al-bayti. Man istata'a ilayhi sabila. Hajj is a duty that people owe to Allah the Almighty, to the ancient house, provided they can afford the means. If they can afford the means, they don't have to. Postpone it until you are able to. I have the money, Shaykh, but it is not your money. It is a money that you owed somebody. So you must pay it off first, unless if the person pardons you or gives you a postponal and you are capable to do both. You see, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَوْفُوا بِالْعُقُودِ is an ayah which takes lessons and lessons to learn from the command of fulfilling the contracts and obligations. And remember, we've mentioned in the beginning, Provided it is not a contract to do something haram. Yani, somebody's parents or father. This is a question I just read, I received on my page. Somebody's father uh, rented a building for a business which is haram. Maybe to sell liquor, to sell whatever. Then the father died. I am as a ear have the right to honor this contract or to void it. We gotta ask first, is this contract halal or haram? It's haram. Because you assisted somebody to do what is forbidden, to sell wine, to sell lotto tickets, to sell whatever is forbidden. In this case, renting and hiring this place for a business which is haram, according is haram, and the earning is haram. Now, I have the right to renew the contract, to honor it, or to seize it, you must seize it. So you must not fulfill a contract which is forbidden or entail something which is haram. Brothers and sisters, still more to come with the next beautiful ayat of Surah As-Saf, but before that we're gonna take a short break and we'll be back inshallah in a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned. <laughs> One day the Prophet ﷺ came out to the companions عنهم, and he said to them, don't you bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship and he has no partners? Don't you bear witness that I'm the messenger of Allah? Don't you bear witness that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the companions of Allah anhum, they said, yes, O Prophet of Allah. Then the Prophet sallallahu said, فأبشروا. have the glad tidings, the great news as a result of this. Because the Quran has two ends to it. One end with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and one end in your hands. Then he said to them, alayhi salatu wasalam, فَتَمَسَّكُوا بِهِ Hold fast to it, because you would never be led astray, and you would never be perished if you're holding fast to the Book of Allah. Because of that, join us every week in Quran in depth, where we recite and reflect and ponder over the verses of the Quran. We go in depth into the verses, following the ways of the Prophet ﷺ and the companions عنهم, when they used to take the verses, one set of verses after another, they would recite it, they would reflect upon the meanings of it and they would act according to it and then they would go to the next set of verses. Join us every week in Quran in depth so that we would recite and reflect and learn more about the Book of Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our life and to make us among those who follow the Quran and the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.
People judge Islam based on what the Muslims do. The fact is, Islam is perfect, but the Muslims are not. However, it is not hard for us to implement and there are ways for us to be the ideal Muslims. Join me, Dr. Rayan Arab, in this new program, The Ideal Muslim, so that we could discover the ways of how we could be ideal Muslims. <laughs> Why are we fighting each other? Look at the barak and the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put into this farm. Where the cloud comes and rains just for him. SubhanAllah. I mean, my brother goes and works and he provides for me and I just sit back and I, and I worship. So they have it divided where one works and the other one worships. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu said, Akhuk khayrun mink, that your brother is better than you. He was a man who devoted his life solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshiping Allah day and night. And here he's accused, he's falsely accused of Allah. Three people that Allah loves. And as a Muslim, as soon as you hear this, you're like, who are these three? I wonder who they are. How can I be from them? Who are they? And these are things that you, you'll find it. The people who are attached to the dunya sometimes, it's not a manly thing. It's more of a feminine type thing. It's a soft thing. That Allah said, whoever strives for us, that verily we should guide them to our ways. And indeed, Allah will be with the doers of good. So if you're from the doers of good, ones who are striving, Allah is going to be with you, He's going to assist you, He's going to help you, inshallah. He would come every night and He would give this milk to His parents first and then give the milk to the rest of the family. One night He was late, He came home late. So what does He do? He holds that milk and won't let anybody drink it. Not His children, not His wife, until His parents wake up in the morning and they drink it first. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. The following reference in the chapter, the chapter of the obligation of fulfilling the promises and pledges is basically two verses, ayat uh, of Surah As-Saf, chapter number 61. The two verses, the second and the third, in which Allah the Almighty says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ كَبُرَ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ تَقُولُوا مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Which means, oh, who you believe, again, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا So he is reminding the audience <clears throat> by the means of their faith, if you truly believe, pay attention. Why do you preach what you don't practice? It is most hateful in the sight of Allah that you say that which you do not do. It's such an evil trait and a very bad habit that you preach something and you do its opposite. This is indeed one of the signs of hypocrisy. And Allah the Almighty described it as مَقْتًا النَّطْءُ لِي مَقْتًا كَبُرَ مَقْتًا What is the word مَقْتًا and what is كَبُرَ مَقْتًا المَقْت which means hatred كَبُرَ مَقْتًا it is the worst of hatred so 
this practice of preaching something and doing its opposite, not being honest with yourself, is most hated by Allah the Almighty. Okay. What is the reason behind the revelation of these verses? The companions in Medina, before the prescription of jihad, and before these ayat were revealed, awfully have asked the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, what is the best deed? We want to learn about the best of deeds in order to do it. What is the best act that will bring us close to Allah? So when Allah the Almighty prescribed jihad, some of the companions felt heavy. They did not really want to be involved in fighting, in bloodshed, in sacrificing their bodies and souls, you know. مِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ Allah the Almighty described the condition of some of the Sahaba at that time. Some they really were after dunya and some were after the hereafter. Those who were after the hereafter, uh, they were most willing to sacrifice their lives for the sake of Allah. So they were seeking the martyrdom. But those who were after the dunya were hoping only to obtain the ghanaim. And on the battle of Badr, Allah the Almighty confronted them that uh, some of them wanted the ghanima, which is the caravan, without fighting. But Allah the Almighty made this whole setup so that Muslims for the first time will confront their enemies and will fight for the sake of Allah. And it will be a turning point in the life of the entire Muslim Ummah. So when Allah the Almighty prescribed jihad, when Allah the Almighty allowed them to fight back and defend themselves, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ it was very obvious that some of the companions were reluctant and they felt heavy and they thought it would be better uh, not to fight. So Allah the Almighty revealed these two verses to blame them. You've been asking about what is the best deed and if Allah were to prescribe anything, we'll do it. Here Allah the Almighty prescribed jihad upon you. لما تقولون ما لا تفعلون You've been saying, I would do this, I would do that. And then once it was prescribed, you backed off. This is most hated by Allah the Almighty to preach something or to promise something and you do not fulfill it. That is the meaning of كَبُرَ مَقَةً عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ تَقُولُ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ Also brothers and sisters, um, Allah the Almighty Said in Surah at tawbah chapter number 9, verse number 75, وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ عَاهَدَ اللَّهَ لَإِنْ آتَانَا مِنْ فَضْلِهِ لَنَصَّدَّقَنَّا وَلَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Wow! This is in the same line. Some people made covenants with Allah the Almighty. If he were to give us out of his bounty, if he were to enrich in us and make us rich, if he were to grant us prosperity, most certainly لا نصدقنا. There are different means of confirmation here. The lam lil qasam. We swear. نصدقنا. And also the noon by the end lil tawkid. Most certainly we shall give in a charity. ولا نكوننا. Again, same means of confirmation. We swear. We will be amongst righteous because now we have plenty of wealth. So that will spare us plenty of time to worship, to pray at night. We don't have to worry about going to work, earning my, uh, our provision, because we will, be, we will be well off. And then what happened? What happened is that when Allah Almighty enriched them out of His bounty, they backed off. They neglected their promises. فَلَمَّا آتَاهُمْ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ بَخِلُوا بِهِ وَتَوَلَّوا وَهُمْ مُعْرِضُونَ They turned to be very miser, cheap. They didn't give any charity. And they turned away. And they neglected their covenants with Allah the Almighty. As a result, Allah the Almighty punished them. And الْجَزَاءُ مِنْ جِنْسِ الْعَمَلِ The person 
will be recompensed according to his intention and according to his action. هل جزاء الإحسان إلا الإحسان؟ Allah rewards the good for good. And he punishes the evil with evil, with punishment. فلما تولوا, then Allah the Almighty says, in the following ayah 77, فأعقبهم نفاقا في قلوبهم إلى يوم يلقونه بما أخلف الله ما وعدوه وبما كانوا يكذبون. So Allah punished them by casting nifaq, hypocrisy, in their hearts until the day on which they shall meet him. Why? Because they broke their covenant with Allah. بِمَا أَخْلَفُوا اللَّهَ مَا وَعَدُوهُ And as a result of the lying. The worst trait ever is lying. And it is the source behind, the source of all evil. And it is the source of all the evil traits of hypocrisy, whether breaking the promise or not fulfilling the trust or uh, constantly uh, lying when you speak. It is because of al kadib May Allah protect us against that. So Allah Almighty punished them, and the punishment would, was from the same, from the nature of the same evil deed, which is they broke the promise. So Allah the Almighty cast nifaq, hypocrisy, in their hearts. And it was not transient, it was not temporary, it was lasting until the day of judgment, until they meet Allah the Almighty. This is a serious warning, brothers and sisters. The ayat are not talking about some people in the past who have become hypocrites and are gone. The ayat are warning us against sometimes people make promises with Allah the Almighty because they are in adversity, because they are in a big affliction, in a big test. A lot of people, a lot of students, before the finals, they say, Oh Allah, if I pass the exam safely, if I score good this time, I promise I shall fast every Monday and Thursday. I promise that I will donate all my saving in a charity. I promise that I will not miss a single prayer in Jama'ah in the match. Some of these promises are obligations. You got to do it anyway, but he's confirming that he's going to fulfill it. If you were to deliver, if you were to deliver me out of this hardship, if you were to give me that much, if you were to save me out of this calamity. In fact, the Prophet وسلم, said about this, النذر المعلق, that it is a nazr or a vow which shall not change the decree of Allah the Almighty. إنما يستخرج به من البخيل. It is simply one of the means through which Allah the Almighty extracts the sadaqa from a stingy person. This person will not to give in a charity unless if he was to be put in this situation. And Allah the Almighty have already preordained that he will be delivered out of this hardship. His son will be cured, his wife will give birth safely, or he will get a job after he was laid off, you know, uh, after a month or two. But he's not very patient. So he keeps saying every day, oh Allah, if you give me a job, I will donate that much. I will slaughter a cow and distribute its meat. And that's why... Most of those people, if you are following the Q&A session and ask what you will hear a lot, a lot of people call in and say that I made a nazr, that if I find a good wife, or we made a nazr, that if my wife and I get a child because we've been trying for six, seven years, that I would give that much in a charity. I made a nazr, that because I was tested positive in, you know, hepatitis or liver disease, that if Allah the Almighty were to cure me, that I shall not miss a single night of night prayer. I shall pray on every single night. I have made a nazar, I have made a vow, I have made a vow. And now, when Allah delivers, and whenever they are cured, whenever their need is fulfilled, they come to pick up the phone and say, okay, what is the ransom? Because I'm not able to do it. I'm not able to fast three days. I'm not able to give that much in a charity. I'm not. So they think that by giving this nazar or making this vow, they trick Allah. They can trick their maker. They can actually change their destiny. No, that's not going to happen at all. What is happening? This is simply a means to disclose the reality of a miser person, a cheap one. So some people will fulfill and will pay will slaughter the cow and distribute its meat. And some people will turn around and come and ask, Sheikh, I made a vow to distribute a whole cow. Can I make it a rabbit? Can it be a rooster? 
You know? No, it can't be. And guess what? Your intention was to slaughter a goat, a sheep, a cow, and distribute its meat among the poor. You're not allowed to taste it. You see, in the case of Udhiyah, in the case of the Hadi, in the case of the voluntary charity, in the case of Aqiqah, it is recommended that you should eat out of the meat of your uh, animal. It is recommended that you should serve your family and you can keep one third of it, you know, and distribute amongst your neighbors, even family members who are rich. But in the case of another, when your intent was to give it to the poor, then you're not allowed to taste it. So will I give the whole cow, the meat of the whole cow to the poor? Yes, sir. Isn't it a condition that you stipulated upon yourself? Yes. So that's why Allah Almighty disclosed the reality of those munafiqeen because this is a trait of hypocrisy. They make promises even with Allah the Almighty. And when it comes to fulfill, uh, when Allah the Almighty delivers, they do what? They fail to fulfill. Willingly and deliberately. And as a result, فَأَعْقَبَهُمْ نِفَاقًا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ إِلَى يَوْمِ يَلْقَوْنَهُ بما أخلف الله ما وعدوه وبما كانوا يكذبون. Okay. The following uh, reference is the first hadith in the chapter, hadith number 688. The hadith is uh, collected by both Imams Bukhari and Muslim. May Allah have mercy on them. And it is narrated by the great companion Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal ayatul munafiqi thalath idha haddatha kathab wa idha wa'ada akhlaf wa idha tumina khan muttafaqun alayh In another narration collected by Imam Muslim wa in sama wa salla wa za'ama annahu Muslim Abu Huraira may Allah be pleased with him narrated that the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said there are three signs of a hypocrite when he speaks he lies when he makes a promise he breaks it and when he is entrusted he betrays his trust up to that this is the narration which is agreed upon its authenticity according to Imam Muslim there is an extra statement in which the Prophet sallallahu says even if he fasts, even if he performs the prayers and claims to be Muslim, he is not. What do we have here? We have a serious warning again is falling into hypocrisy simply due to breaking the promise, betraying the trust and lying. And all the evil traits are evolving around the evil trait of lying. Whoever promises and does not fulfill his promise deliberately is a liar. Whoever is entrusted and does not fulfill the trust and he betrays, he is a liar because he has to deny it. There are two types of hypocrisy, brothers and sisters. One which is amali and one which is aqadi. The aqadi, which is pertaining to belief, this is similar to those who pretended to accept Islam in public, but in reality, they were never Muslims. There were many, and hypocrisy started after the migration, and particularly after the success that Muslims achieved on the battle of Badr. So a lot of people pretended to accept Islam in order either to get protection under the umbrella of the Muslim Ummah, or in order to gain worldly benefit and take advantage of uh, you know, some privileges or in order to be the enemies within, such as in the case of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He was the chief of his people, and he declared his opposition to the Prophet and to Muslims all the time. But after the Battle of Badr, and when the 314 defeated, utterly defeated, the 1,000 Meccans, oh, everyone shrunk, including Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Then he slowed down, and he figured out that there is no point of publicly opposing Muhammad and the Muslims. It is better to pretend to accept Islam and to be the enemy within. And he tried his best so long as he was alive after he uh, pretended to accept Islam. 
even through building another masjid, Masjid al-Durar, so that he would gather and meet with his munafiqeen, with his followers. How many were they? They were many. They were in hundreds. Believe it or not, on the battle of Uhud, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam discussed the matter that the Meccans are approaching Medina, what shall we do? And the outcome, the opinion of the vast majority was that we shall go out and confront them outside Al-Medina. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put on his armor and he proceeded on. He marched forth with the army. On the way and before reaching Uhud, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul withdrew with 300 of his followers. That's one third of the army to that extent. So that's called Aqadi. They never believed in Allah. And that's why the Messenger of Allah in one hadith says, the heaviest prayers for the, the non-believers, the munafiqeen who pretended to accept faith, but they were not believers in reality. Fajr Because they both come at the time of sleep and rest. Fajr particularly, you're required to jump off your warm bed. Remove your comfort, make wudu, and go to the masjid and attend the prayer. Who would do that but a true believer? And Isha likewise, it's late, we want to sleep, we've been working hard, now we want to rest, we want to enjoy the company of our families. Now please, make sure you pray Isha before going to sleep. For the believers, it's a piece of cake, it's a comfort for their eyes, it's a peace for their minds. It is a prayer. For the hypocrites, it was a source of pain. It was extremely heavy. And that's why they built another masjid so that they can, you know, skip the prayers as much as they want. And whenever they're missing, we were in the other masjid. Allah the Almighty ordered the Prophet ﷺ to burn down this masjid, and it's called Masjid al Dirar, the opposition headquarter. This is Nifaq concerning aqidah and belief. They were never believers. Allah the Almighty warned us against them and against hypocrisy and the hypocrites in the Quran heavily to the point that if you open the Quran from the beginning, besides that there is a, an entire chapter in the Quran which is known as Surah Al-Munafiqoon. There is a chapter called Surah Al-Mu'minun, the believers, and another chapter called Surah Al-Munafiqoon, the hypocrites. And there is of course Al-Kafirun, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah the Almighty described the traits of the believers only in three ayat. ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك وبالآخرة هم يوقنون أولئك على هدى من ربهم وأولئك هم المفلحون Three verses third, fourth, and fifth. Then he described the non-believers in the sixth and the seventh verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. Then from the eighth all the way to the twentieth verse, thirteen ayah, Allah the Almighty is talking only about the hypocrites, munafiqeen. It is that serious to warn us against them. And when do they prosper? When do they become, you know, their number grow bigger? Whenever the ummah is strong and powerful. But when the ummah is weak, they have no interest. When the ummah is oppressed, they don't have interest in joining the ummah and pretending to be Muslims. Okay. So this is nifaq concerning belief, aqadi. For them, Allah the Almighty says, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ وَلَنْ تَجِدَ لَهُمْ نَصِيرًا سورة النساء Most certainly the hypocrites will be on the lowest floor on the bottom of hellfire. Even beneath the non-believers, they are even worse than the non-believers. And he shall not find any support or no helper for them. The other kind of hypocrisy is al-amali. In the practice, the person may be Muslim. But because of practicing some of the traits of the munafiqeen, he is practicing one or two or three, and he is at a big risk. Whoever possesses all the traits of the munafiqeen is a munafiq, and whoever possesses one of the traits of hypocrisy, then he has this evil trait of the munafiqeen. The Prophet ﷺ has said that the sign of a hypocrite are three. There are three signs. 
إذا حدث كذب. There is a difference between that. Sometimes he lies and إذا حدث كذب. Whenever he speaks, he lies. He is a liar by nature. He can't but lie. He constantly lies. وإذا وعد أخلف. And whenever he promises, he breaks his promise. And whenever he is entrusted, always, always, he is a treacherer. Okay? He betrays his trust. So if a person does that on a regular basis, then he's a pure munafiq. These are the traits. And these are not all the traits of the munafiq, but some of the very prominent traits. And as you see that they all revolve around the evil trait of lying. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says in the other narration of Imam Muslim, even if he prays, performs, if he fasts, performs the prayer, and claims to be Muslim, which means that he is referring to the nifaq concerning aqidah. He is a constant liar. He always breaks his promise, and he constantly betrays whenever he is entrusted. Brothers and sisters, we run out of time for this episode. May Allah protect us again as these evil traits. May Allah keep us always truthful, fulfilling our promises. These are the qualities of Iman. And until next episode, I leave you all in the care and the protection of Allah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about him in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price.